Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. As we continue our deep dive into Federal Reserve disingenuineness. Hey, Stacy. Yes, it's a deep dive into all the times Max Kaiser, Kaiser Report, Stacy Herbert. We've been right over and over. We were right last time we mentioned how Jamie Dimon had capitulated and agreed finally that the Kaiser Report was right on Bitcoin. Well, of course, it was Kaiser Report where you first heard about the threat of stagflation, high unemployment, high inflation. Well, the Fed Chair Jerome Powell, i.e. J. Powell, he says, well, inflation is high and unemployment rate is high. Right, right. Uh, ostensibly, the Fed has uh, two jobs. One is full employment. The other is price stability. So they're failing on both of their primary jobs. And in a way, that was predictable. Because if you're simply printing money to bail out bankers all day long, you create a situation in which you do not have any reliable price discovery in the economy for any of the co components that make up the economy. This leads to both corruption and malinvestment, a wealth and income gap, and as we see now, stagflation. You have unemployment high and inflation is high. And both of these things are now structural, cyclical. They cannot be cured by simply extending and pretending. They can't, if the US were to introduce 100 year bonds or 200 year bonds, that's not gonna solve it. Negative interest rates are not gonna solve it. Uh, this is now pretty much uh, heading toward a real catastrophe. Yeah, and again, one analogy we've made in the past is the cargo cult, and the cargo cult was in the South Pacific Islands who were suddenly confronted by the advanced Japanese Army, uh, the, the Air Force, and then the U.S. Air Force, and they saw all these planes arrive, and they delivered food and brought all these things, right? And then once the armies left, they uh, thought that the signaling for the plane would deliver all those goods again. And that's what we have with the Fed, is like we have some sort of memory of pre-1971 gold standard wealth creation. We, we remember manufacturing. We remember when we had all that wealth creation, we had wealth. And the wealthy people and wealth, the wealth was measured in money. So if we just print more of this money, uh, things will suddenly emerge or appear, right? And you've really seen that with the, the lockdown. So a lot of people are not <laughs> working, and now we're seeing the shortages. But their, their, their response is like, the money printing will continue until morale improves, and the shortages, therefore, will continue until morale improves. Because Ford CEO Farley says, we'll be short of key electronic components till the end of next year. So that's another over 12 month period where we're gonna have more shortages. Ford has shut down production of automobiles because of shortages of electronic components. So the shortages are gonna continue. They're gonna meet that with more money printing, which is only gonna cause more shortages because people will think they're wealthy and they think they have money, but the actual goods and services and the production of those goods and services are what actually create the wealth. The policymakers think that the economy is this Formula One car that went into a pit stop for COVID and that it's gonna come out of that pit stop racing ahead back in the race. But in fact, in 2008, uh, and then accentuated in COVID, the car hit a brick wall. It crashed. So there's not, you can't just come out of it and, and start the race. You have to rebuild the car from scratch. So because mm -hmm. of all the malinvestment, because of all the crony capitalism, because of all the corruption, the basic supply lines, the basic tenants of free market capitalism in America have shattered uh, into a million pieces. And so Jay Powell, of course, after 40 years of Fed interventionism by simply extending and pretending and printing a lot of money, they got into this cargo cult, as you call it, mentality where simply waving a flag, uh, you know, essentially printing more money is going to make all the problems disappear. Meanwhile, politically, what we've seen in America is really remarkable. The, the liberal left and their cohorts in the media, even though that this 
policy has caused incredible human suffering in America. They've effectively marginalized those people as, quote, deplorables uh, and really made scapegoats of the victims of Jay Powell. And they've often said that this is a victimless crime, money printing and extortion that's practiced at the Fed. And yet, uh, if I look at those 90,000 dead Americans last year from opiate overdose, I'd say, Jay Powell, you've got blood on your hands because that's a direct result of malinvestment, money printing, and rogue economics that you're practicing as a charlatan. Well, speaking of charlatans, Max, I do want to bring up another note from, I think it was the last episode or the episode before, we talked about the revelation of what people are calling it is insider trading from the various Fed chairmen, presidents of across America, and uh, two of them stepped down in the past week so far, uh, Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan and Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren have both resigned to spend more time with their massive stock portfolios. <laughs> right, so two of the, uh, of the central bank chairs in America were caught red-handed, stealing, trading on inside information, milking and bilking the American public, distorting markets, causing financial mayhem, <laughs> and uh, essentially operating as, as I've said many for many years, people think it's a bit of an exaggeration, but I think it's financial terrorism. I don't think it can make any difference between Jay Powell and extremism uh, in any other country. This is financial extremism. The results uh, are ideologically unsound, producing and deaths. I mean, it's it's a financial terrorist. It's well, very, very well, simple. Let's, uh, let's compare it to what um, F uh, Frederick Bastiat said, where, you know, that when corrupt men come together, essentially, they'll create the laws that justify their corruption. And one thing like Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan was um, like an active hedge fund. He was like his own hedge fund. He was actively trading. Um, now, it's important to note that the, he's a Fed president of Dallas and the and the the member, the feds, you know, like in Dallas, Richmond and all these other Minneapolis, they're um, private sector, whereas Jay Powell at the Fed in New York's in Washington, D.C., is considered like a government worker. So they, they have a little bit more leeway. But he says like his argument was that um, he passed all his trades by their general counsel and their the, their rules uh, allowed this. But, you know, in terms of the, the chaos that has been caused by the Fed interventions in the economy, I want to point out that you know, this all started, as you mentioned, in 2008, 2009, during the financial crisis. And, you know, Kai's report first came up uh, on board then to tell you what was going on. And one thing we saw in the few years afterward was similar sort of um, stagflation, rising inflation, food price inflation, uh, energy price inflation, revolutions around the world, and the calls for a $1 trillion platinum coin. That's back, too. All that stuff is back right now. It's like it's it's like a fractal. This is a fractal of economic chaos nonstop. It's getting like more and more. The fractal is getting more like it's coming faster. Right. The 2008 was met with a wall of money, uh, essentially for the central bank to buy back a lot of assets. Yeah. And if you're running one of the regional central banks, it's very tempting to front run those buys with insider trading. And the fact that general counsel has given his blessing to their crime wave, it, it just because they passed a law. It's like, you know, when Citibank bought Traveler's Insurance, they broke Glass-Steagall, the law that's been on the books for decades, and then they retroactively made it legal. When you have a group of terrorists in America running the banks like you do now, Jay Powell, they have no adherence to the rule of law because they have an ideology that says that if we kill somebody in the name of our profit, we're godly. Okay, and that's America today. That's America today, and it's a big problem, world. Well, I think it's like the fiat system. It encourages that, and it, um, it basically has caused the situation that they say that they want to um, stop. For example, like Warren Buffett, uh, he's always, first of all, he's always talking about um, like, oh, how he pays fewer taxes, less a, per a, a percentage of his ta income to taxes than a secretary, yet he doesn't like willingly pay more. In fact, he always like strives to like pay less in taxes. Well, on top of that, for the, of a few decades, he pointed out what was true, which was that share buybacks is a bad thing because you're betting against America and you know, you could, you could use that money, usually the debt money to buy your shares back, or you could invest in America and invest in production. Well, 
he's one of the top 10, Berkshire Hathaway is for sure. Top 10 share buyback queens, big tech, except Intel, big banks, except Wells Fargo, Buffett, incinerate most cash ever, and Q2. The rest lags. Funded by debt since 2012, share buybacks have totaled $5.5 trillion, and corporate debt soared by $4.7 trillion. So in Q2, uh, these top 10 companies, they did share buybacks of $85 billion. They accounted for 43% of the total. Here's uh, looking back to 2012, how much they've bought. You see it's accelerating as the fragility of the system accelerates. Apple, Facebook, Google, Berkshire Hathaway, Microsoft, Oracle, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citi, and Charter are all the ones that bought back the most. But Wolf Richter says, even today, as crazy as this sounds, the $5.5 trillion that the S&P 500 companies incinerated on buying back their own shares is a lot of money. They could have been invested in expansion projects in the U.S. and in labor in the U.S. rather than in cheap labor overseas and in training or, God forbid, the companies could have tried to somewhat less aggressively dodge U.S. income taxes and pay a little bit more, given that the U.S. government deficit has been horrendous for years and has become more horrendous with the corporate tax cut of 2017 and has become a lot more horrendous starting in March 2020 with the pandemic. But um, as he points out, they've been borrowing heavily instead, further destabilizing the system, further enabling the Fed to justify their money printing. And lo and behold, the cycle continues. Right, that's the ideology, to, to justify the money printing. Let's be clear, the $5 trillion used to buy back stock by Warren Buffett and others was money that was gifted to them from the central bank at 0% interest, and in some cases, a negative interest rate. They were paid to borrow money, as you saw in Europe, with uh, the LVMH buying Tiffany, for money that the European Central Bank gifted them on top of the zero that they were charging for that money. So this, you know, and I'll say this again, I'm sorry, but this is the reality, folks. This is financial apartheid. We've got to borrow money at 17 or 18% on our credit card. Warren Buffett borrows money at zero. There's no difference between that and living in a Bantustan and being cut off. And I know that the results are poverty and death because the po life expectancy is down. Infant mortality is up. Wealth and income gap is increasing. Thanks, Jay Powell. Atrocious. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to return to our conversation with Rick Ackerman of Rick's Picks. Rick, welcome back. Thanks for inviting me on, Max. Always a pleasure. All right. I wanted to continue uh, talking about a topic from the previous episode in terms of inflation versus deflation. Uh, you point out that you've got a situation where the global derivative markets is, rests on a bed of U.S. Treasury bills. And these U.S. Treasury bills are in short supply, and they are being printed as uh, quickly as possible. But um, the result is that this is not causing inflation per se, but deflation. Dig into it a little bit. Let's just say it's building a deflationary juggernaut that will be far bigger than any inflationary effect we get from, let's say, stimulus packages right now. And there's a lot more that's being leveraged out than treasuries. You know, there's been a big bet on the energy patch, and uh, there's no telling how much of those, how much of the action in derivatives has been uh, leveraged out from energy resources. But it's no accident, no coincidence that we see oil prices moving up seemingly irrespective of demand. Uh, the coal crude market has become kind of a, a big play on leverage and inflation. Okay, but, hold uh, on. So that's not inflationary. It's Let's say it's, it's unactualized deflation. We keep having to stimulate more and inflate more simply to avoid deflation. But deflation, when it happens, is going to happen so precipitously that there'll be no mechanism really for, for counteracting it with whatever you know you could get out there with an announcement that everybody's uh, savings account at every bank in america has added three zeros to it but uh you can understand why that wouldn't do the job so and one one point that i made that's really basic is that why do we need a quad two plus quadrillion dollar financial edifice to, to support a global economy that does uh perhaps a tenth of that in actual goods and services 
So uh, the, the answer is, of course, that the business of planet Earth is no longer getting your hands dirty making things. Uh, it's really just shuffling paper. So we've, we've built this immensity. Uh, everybody's sort of living off and supposedly growing wealthy by the, the financial market, but it's so much bigger than what we actually buy and sell that that sort of that, that shows you where we're headed. And to that point, what do you make of recent reports that the heads of the largest banks and investment groups in America reportedly meet with the heads of the People's Bank of China and senior Chinese government officials last week regarding this exact situation that you're talking about? And so it looks, on the face of it anyway, that Wall Street's trying to get China to bail out the latest round of bankrupt Wall Street banks, Rick. Or to get China to at least appear to bail it out in a way that they know will calm uh, in investors. Um, you know, I think it's good that they're talking about how China should spin this whole thing, but we should have learned by now that China's going to do it its own way. And heaven forbid, one of those ways might be to simply let the chips fall where they may, which is not the U.S. way of doing it. Okay, let's get back to your phrase, unactualized deflation. Uh, you know, we've been talking about inflation versus deflation now for probably 10 years, and uh, it's an interesting kind of debate because, as you point out, the, the global GDP is not driven by making stuff anymore. It's all been financialized, and so it's really operating under a different set of rules. Uh, you know, I liken it to flying through the Bermuda Triangle, where all your dials and on the dashboard are spinning wildly in different directions, and you're completely lost in there, and pretty soon you crash. Because you don't get good price signals. If, if the central banks are just printing money for any reason, without any economic justification whatsoever, you have malinvestment, you have no real price signals telling you what's really going on. Uh, so you're describing this as essentially fake inflation, unactualized deflation. And it, you, you have this plane that's flying in this soup of derivatives, but it's actually, uh, if you were to take a step back, it's crashing into the ocean. It just hasn't hit the ocean yet, Rick. You know, I came across uh, old emails that uh, it was an exchange between uh, myself and a, and a fellow named Fred Hapgood, who used to put some very interesting uh, blog items out on the web. And I, I was saying, you know, I give this whole banking system, we're going to collapse within the next six months. What do you want to bet? And of course, I wrote that back in, I think it was 2008 or so. So with reason, people say, oh, you guys have been talking about the sky is falling for so long. Why should anybody believe you? But it, simple common sense will tell you that, that we're not headed in a good direction, that it can't possibly end well. And I guess the, uh, the, the only thing I could say in defense of my, my own premature call on disaster is that I lack the imagination to see how pumped things could get. And one of the reasons for that is everybody benefits. It's like all the, 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 the one percenters are all getting richer for doing nothing all the time. And it's it feels sort of like win, win, win. Everybody wins except, of course, the, uh, the middle class and, uh, and the have-nots. So that's why it's persisted for so long and why uh, folly and hubris could dominate without being challenged as long as it has. But, uh, it, but if you just sort of apply your common sense in what you were just saying, talking about the, the spinning dials and everything, we're, we're absolutely positively getting there. The old have-nots versus the have-yachts, as we used to say. <laughs> All right. So you also write, quote, we are in a fourth generation war, not unlike Klaus's fourth industrial revolution. OK, who's Klaus? What, 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 what are you saying there? Uh, again, this is a, an interesting Sean Brown metaphor. And uh, he, he's, he's essentially saying that the industrialization or the industrial revolution took place in a way where nobody could have predicted the outcome. It was big, and no one really had the big picture uh, initially, but it just sort of grew and grew and grew and uh, and uh, subsumed whatever reality you lived in. So uh, we have the same thing. We've got a, a financial edifice that nobody understands. We've grown a, a system that's so radically different from any capitalism that uh, Adam Smith or David Ricardo would have imagined. and. Uh, 
we're we're going to reap the consequences. I have to push back on that. It seems like nothing new under the sun, and economic is always comes down to incentives. And when you have the state take away those incentives by printing money vis-a-vis -vis socialism, you have failure. And when you have free market capitalism that breeds a more comp competition, you have economic growth and genuine GDP um, spread throughout the economy. But uh, I, I, I get your point. Um, let's talk about supply chain issues uh, that seem to be growing worse. I mean, I'm reading the the news every single day and um, I, you know it pops up in unexpected places like oh we're running out of helium you know oh we can't find any lithium you know or you know uh chips are missing from manufacturing cars you know areas that you wouldn't you don't you wouldn't you didn't know we're at risk you didn't know we're vulnerable but you know these are the, that that's how supply chains crack up they you know it's like the like a wheel missing on a shopping cart you know it's just like suddenly it doesn't work it, it, and talk to us about what you see well, I read that uh, the hit the automakers are going to take in 220, two, two, 2022 uh, will be something like $220 billion because of these shortages. And the price of uh, new cars and delivery times have been pushed way, way up. You know, you'll pay a $15,000 premium for getting a new car, and they'll give you like a November delivery date. I think that we had such a Swiss watch intricacy of just-in-time deliveries and inventory that the screwing up that's happened so far is going to permanently impair the supply chain. I don't think we're ever going to get out of this, and I, it would be very optimistic to say that it's not going to get worse. So I think we're in real trouble, and you know everything from surfboard blanks to uh, styrofoam blanks to make surfboards to you, you name it, the, uh, the most critical shortage is labor. And uh, I think the labor shortage is causing the whole American system, small business, which is, has always been the backbone, backbone of the U.S. economy, small businesses are collapsing. You know, I, I just drove 9,000 miles this summer, took a long roadie, and you go into something like Maryland House uh, to get a snack, and, and five of the six snack places are closed. Nobody can get help. And we know they're out there. There are people who could fill all those jobs, but obviously the government stimulus packages have have uh, disincentivized work. So these supply chain things, including uh, the problems, including the labor shortage, they're just going to get worse. And it seems like it's getting crazy dangerous. Uh, for example, drivers needed to drive gas, you know, uh, big gas tankers around to fill gas stations. Um, they're in short supply, so they're going to, change the requirement from getting that six months of training that you need to learn how to operate one of those rigs to just, hey, you know, you got a driver's license here. You can go drive an oil rig. You can go drive a gas rig, right? Okay. I mean, that sounds like such an infrastructure collapse and such a disregard for, for safety that, um, you know, we're going to start to see like what you might call an, an apocalyptic breakdown. I mean, it gets, it's going to get bad, Rick, it would seem. I absolutely agree. And, and you know, there's a, the old, you just can't find good help anymore. But I'm sure you and everybody else has noticed no matter where you go, whether it's a restaurant or some place where there's a counter and someone's on the other side trying to help you, the help is getting worse. They're less knowledgeable. Uh, at the at the online level, you can't get support for anything. Every company is avoiding talking to its customers because they don't have the manpower to talk to them. And every we get that message that says, you know, we have a, an unusually long wait time. Too many people, too many customers calling us. The fact is, that's not the problem. The problem is too few people to support those calls. So, uh, but, you know, this, this isn't uh, any hypothesis. Everybody is seeing it all around them now that just businesses are doing business in, in sloppier and sloppier ways. Yeah, and the media is comically not covering any of this. It's really, they MSNBC, CNBC, ABC, CBS, they've really become Pravda-like in their ignorance, their total, uh, you know, non-coverage of anything that's happening out there. They just carry these... Uh, uh, headlines, happy talk headlines. You know, it's really, it's really, uh, Rick, nutty. It's crazy. Yeah, well, they all come out of our better J schools, Columbia, Northwestern, and Missouri. And you think the, 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 the teachers have never, you know, spent a day in real journalism. They're just sort of, uh, uh, what was I reading the other day? It was about the idea of uh, 
of reparation journalism that we were always, we've already become apologetic and 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 the way we govern but now the newspapers are supposed to essentially turn advocate and not only just uh, trying to redress perceived injustices of the past but objectivity is being essentially lost in journalism. The idea is that a reporter should go out there and uh, and make a ruckus according to his his idea of injustice, his or her. So uh, it's it's a very very bad trend when when journalists can't even cover the news. They're all out there advocating for whatever. Rick Ackerman, the legend over there at Rick's Picks Newsletter. Go for the options trading. Stay for the philosophy. Rick, thanks for being on Kaiser Report. Great pleasure, Max. Again, thanks for inviting me. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank our guest, Rick Ackerman of Rick's Picks. Until next time, bye, y'all. 